guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering genital urinary issues. If you guys haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. I'm also now on TikTok and Instagram. My handle is the same, Nexus Nursing. Be sure to check that out because the content that I cover on uh, TikTok is different than what I cover here on YouTube. So it'll give you extra studying time. Also, don't forget my audio lessons are now available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So if you're struggling with um, a certain, some um, content and you just need that extra help, I have audio lessons available on my website where I actually explain the content. So when you practice the questions, it makes even more sense. So guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. The nurse is admitting a client diagnosed with acute renal failure. Which question is most important for the nurse to ask during the admission interview? One, have you recently traveled outside of the U.S.? Two, did you recently begin a vigorous exercise program? Three, is there a chance you've been exposed to a virus? Or four, what over-the-counter medications do you take regularly? And guys, the correct answer is four, what over-the-counter medications do you take regularly? Why would we ask that question? Because many over-the-counter medications such as NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they are nephrotoxic. They are very harmful um, to the kidneys. So we are going to ask about that. Now, also, let me tell you some uh, medications, they're over-the-counter medications. Many are also, um, what's the word? They're toxic to the liver as well. Why would that be important when it comes to urinary? Well, things that are, drugs that are toxic to the liver will make the liver not able to metabolize drugs. If the liver can't metabolize drugs, the patient holds on to the drugs longer. The patient holds on to the drugs longer, patient has a toxic level of that drug. Patient has a toxic level of that drug, even if that drug wasn't nephrotoxic. But be, because there's so much of that drug in the system that now it's a toxic level, it's gonna end up harming the kidneys anyway. So it's very important to ask the patient what over-the-counter meds they're taking and also herbs because lots of, lots of herbs are uh, nephrotoxic. Okay, next question. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with acute renal failure. Which laboratory values are most significant for diagnosis of ARF? One, BUN and creatinine. Two, WBC and hemoglobin. Three, potassium and sodium. Or four, bilirubin and ammonia level. And guys, the correct answer is one, BUN and creatinine. BUN and creatinine it are specific um, most specific on this list to the kidneys. Now, if you had to choose between BUN and creatinine, which one would you choose? Creatinine. Because BUN, even though, yes, BUN will uh, tell you how well the kidneys are doing, BUN can be elevated in some other conditions, but creatinine, that is most specific to uh, the kidneys. So yes, BUN and creatinine, but if you're ever asked to choose between the BUN and the creatinine, choose the creatinine when it comes to letting you know how well the kidneys are functioning. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with a rule out ARF. Which condition predisposes the client to developing renal failure? One, diabetes mellitus, two, hypotension, three, aminoglycosides, or four, BPH. And guys, the correct answer is hypotension. And I wanna explain this to you because I have to make sense. When a patient's hypotensive, that means the blood pressure is down, right? If the blood pressure is down, guess what's happening? That means not enough blood is flowing through those vessels. That means not enough blood, oxygens, vitamins, nutrients, everything else that the blood carries, not enough of that is perfusing vital organs such as the brain, the liver, and what? The kidneys. Okay, so having that chronic hypotension means decreased blood flow and it could place the patient in pre-renal failure. Absolutely, uh, number two is um, the correct answer. Before I move on, something else I want you to know, whenever you see a question and they're saying rule out, what really that means is, for example, in this question, what did it say? It said rule out acute renal failure. So what that really means is, that's what they think the patient has a renal failure. So they're going to try to rule everything out to make sure that that's what it is. So whenever you see that phrase rule out, whatever you see rule out, that's what we think it is. We just want to make sure. Okay. That's what we're trying to prove. 
The client's diagnosed with acute renal failure. Which signs and symptoms indicate to the nurse indicate to the nurse the client is in the recovery period? Select all that applies. Guys, how do we treat select all that applies? As true or false. So let's go. One, increase alertness and no seizure activity. True. Very good. That's a good sign. That will let us know that client's recovering. Absolutely. Two, increase hemoglobin and hematocrit. Absolutely. That's a good sign that lets us know that that patient's um, recovering. Absolutely. Three, denial of nausea and vomiting. Absolutely. That's a very good sign that we know that patient's in the recovery period. Four, decrease urine specific gravity. Decrease, false. If that patient was going through the recovery uh, period, that specific gravity would have been increased, not decreased. If it's decreased, that means the kidney's not doing its job. It's not filtering out like it's supposed to, right? So that's false. Uh, five, increase serum creatinine level. Increase, absolutely not. When that creatinine, the BUN and creatinine, when it's elevated, that's what lets us know the kidneys are in trouble. So if the patient was going through the recovery phase, we would see that level go what? Down, not up. So the correct answer is one, two, and three. The client diagnosed with acute renal failure has a serum potassium level of 6.8. Which collaborative treatment should the nurse anticipate for the client? One, administer a phosphate binder. Two, type and cross match for whole blood. Three, assess the client for leg cramps. Or four, prepare the client for dialysis. And guys, the correct answer is for prepare the client for dialysis. So let me explain this to you. In the question, the client has what? A potassium of 6.8. What's our normal potassium supposed to be? 3.5 to 5. And that potassium range, guys, is very narrow. That is a very narrow therapeutic range. Anything outside of that range of 3.5 to 5, the patient could go into what? Dysrhythmias. So this patient's hyperkalemic. And let me keep going. And they're asking about what collaborative effort. Whenever you see that word collaborative, that means it's not something you as a nurse can do by yourself. You're going to have to collaborate with the doctor, the physical therapist, the speech therapist, somebody else. You're working together. It's not something you can do on your own. Okay. So with that being said, patient's potassium level so high. Yeah, prepare the patient with, for dialysis because who else are you going to need on the team? The nephrologist, can you write the order for dialysis? Absolutely not. The nephrologist and everybody else is going to have to be on the same page because we need to get that potassium level down immediately, okay? This is life-threatening for the patient. Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, administer a phosphate binder. Why? The patient's phosphorus level isn't too high. It's their potassium that's too high. So that's false. Two, type and cross match for whole blood. Why? This patient's not anemic. They're not bleeding out. Why are we giving them whole blood? The problem is potassium. So that's wrong. Three, assess the client for leg cramps. With hyperkalemia, yes, that client may have leg cramps, right? But is that going to be our priority? That's number one. That's not going to be our priority with a potassium of 6.8. And number two, what did the question ask us? It said collaborative. When you're assessing a client for leg cramps, do you need anybody to do that? No. As a nurse, you can do that on your own. So the correct answer is four because preparing them for um, dialysis is going to be our priority and we can't do that on, on our own. That's going to be a collaborative effort. You're going to need um, other people on the team to help you, assist you in this. So number four is the correct answer. The nurse is developing a plan of care for a client diagnosed with acute renal failure. Which statement is an appropriate outcome for the client? One, monitor INO every shift. Two, decrease, decrease of pain by three levels on a one to 10 scale. Three, electrolytes are within normal limits. Or four, administer enemas to decrease hyperkalemia. And guys, the correct answer is three, electrolytes are within normal limits. So why is it three and not anything else? Go back to the question. In the question, they're asking us what is an appropriate outcome? What is an appropriate outcome? Number one, monitoring the INO, that's a nursing intervention, that's not an outcome. Um, and when I say outcome, another word for outcome, think of it as a goal, what you want to see happen to the patient, what is a goal for the patient? So one, doing INOs, wonderful, but that's not a goal, that's a nursing intervention. Uh, 
two, decrease of pain by uh, three levels on a one to 10 scale. Well, acute renal failure doesn't cause pain. This is a beautiful answer, but for another question, because acute renal failure doesn't cause pain. So that's not the correct answer. Uh, and the last one, administer enemas to decrease hyperkalemia. Again, that's a nursing intervention, not a goal. So a wonderful goal would be three, electrolytes are within normal limits because when a patient has acute renal failure, their electrolytes are going to be out of whack. Why? Think about it. If the kidney's not working, they're not filtering toxins. They're not filtering toxins. The toxins are staying in the body. That's number one. The kidney's not working, they're not excreting fluid. They're not excreting fluid, the fluid stays in the, stays in the body. That's number two. So here you are with a patient who the kidney's not working, they have all of these toxins in the body and all of these fluid that stays in the body along with the potassium that usually comes out of the urine, the sodium that usually comes out of the urine, but it's building up in the body because it's not coming out in the urine. So of course, if a patient's in renal failure, even if it's acute renal failure, it's gonna throw their electrolytes off balance. So a wonderful goal for the patient that's going through um, acute renal failure is that their electrolytes will stay within normal limits. The client diagnosed with acute renal failure is admitted to the ICU and placed on a therapeutic diet. Which diet is most appropriate for the client? One, high potassium, low, so low calcium diet. Two, low fat, low cholesterol diet. Three, high carb, restricted protein diet. Or four, regular diet with six small feedings a day. And guys, the correct answer is three, high carb and restricted protein. Why? The reason we need the carbs high is that patient needs the calories. Why? Calories give you what? Energy. Energy to fight off infection. Energy to fight off disease. Energy to fight off illness. So that's good. Why restricted protein? What does protein break down into? Ammonia. Toxins. Okay? And I'm using that word toxins lightly when I say ammonia because I just want you to think ammonia, bad, 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 is building up in the body. We don't want it to beat up, build up in the body. We want it to come out in the urine. But if the kidney's not working, every time this patient's eating protein, that protein breaks down into ammonia. The ammonia that's supposed to come out in the urine, is it coming out in the urine? No. It's staying in the patient's blood stream, blood stream and becoming what? Toxic. That's why they're on a restricted protein diet. Because if the kidney's not working, when that protein breaks down into ammonia, which it will, that's what it does, the body's unable to get rid of that ammonia. And now it's basically turned into a poison into the patient's own bloodstream, okay? A male client diagnosed with chronic kidney disease has received the initial dose of erythropoietin, a biological response modifier, a week ago. Which complaint by the client indicates the need to notify the healthcare provider? One, the client complains of flu-like symptoms. Two, the client complains of being tired all the time. Three, the client reports an elevation in his blood pressure. Or four, the client reports discomfort in his legs and back. And guys, the correct answer is three, the client reports an elevation in blood pressure. Why? This has to be reported to doctor because a contraindication for erythropoietin is uncontrolled hypertension. And I want you to think about this, guys. If a patient has uncontrolled hypertension, they have high blood pressure and it's not being controlled. Why would you give erythropoietin something to a patient to make them create more RBCs, which will cause more pressure against the vascular space that will increase the pressure even worse and potentially make the patient have a stroke? Does that make any sense? Think about what erythropoietin does. So of course that's going to elevate the patient's blood pressure. So we're not going to give this to a patient that already has high blood pressure that is not being controlled. Hi, uncontrolled hypertension is an absolute contraindication for that medication erythropoietin. Okay, so that's why that's the correct answer. The nurse is developing a nursing care plan for the client diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. Which nursing problem is priority for the client? One, low self-esteem. Two, def uh, knowledge deficiency. Three, activity intolerance. Or four, excess fluid volume. And guys, the correct answer is four, excess fluid volume. Why? I always tell you this, whenever you get a question that's asking you what the priority is, or let me see how they worded this question. Yes, they said priority. So whenever you get a question that's asking you what the priority is, really what they're asking you is, what is going to kill the patient the fastest 
or keep them alive the longest, either way. And on this list, it's fluid and electrolytes, your uh, fluid, excuse me, excess fluid volume. Physiological integrity, what will kill the patient first and what would kill them, what would um, keep them alive the longest. Fluid and electrolytes, nutrition, ABCs, uh, uh, glucose, what else? Um, vital signs. Anything that will keep the patient alive or kill them the fastest, that is going to be your priority. And on this list, self-esteem, knowledge deficit, activity and tolerance. Yeah, those are uncomfortable, but they're not going to kill you. But number four will kill you. So that's our priority. The client diagnosed with CKD has a new arteriovenous fistula in the left forearm. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, teach a client to carry heavy objects with the right arm. Two, perform all laboratory blood tests on the left arm. Three, instruct the client to lie on the left arm during the night. Or four, discuss the importance of not performing any hand exercises. And guys, the correct answer is one, teach a client to carry heavy objects on the right arm. Why? If you have that AV fistula in your left arm, you don't want to do anything that will cause strain or pressure to that site. So that's why they're telling you to use it on the other arm because we don't want to cause stress to that site at all. Now let's look at our other answer choices. Uh, to perform all lab uh, tests on the left arm, absolutely not. All lab tests are going to be on the opposite where that AV fistula, on the opposite, on the arm opposite of where that AV fistula is. Uh, three, instruct the client to lie on the left arm. No, lie on the other side. We don't want to disrupt that site at all. We're not trying to mess with it at all. Four, discuss the impor importance of not performing hand exercises. That is false. We want the patient to perform hand exercises on the side where that AV fistula is. Why? We want it to mature. So we want them to do those exercises. So the correct answer is number one. The male client diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, secondary to diabetes, has been receiving dialysis for 12 years. The client is notified he will not be placed on the kidney transplant list. The client tells the nurse he will not be back for any more dialysis treatments. Which response by the nurse is most therapeutic? One, you cannot just quit your dialysis. This is not an option. Two, you're angry at not being on the list and you want to quit dialysis? Three, I will call your nephrologist right now so you can talk to the doctor. Four, make your funeral arrangements because you're going to die. It's not four, guys. Okay, so the correct answer is two. You're angry at not being on the list and you want to quit dialysis. What is the nurse doing? That's called reflecting. And it's a form of therapeutic communication. So it's basically observing and repeating. And you know, you're giving that the patient a chance to express their feelings. Okay, that's a form of therapeutic communication. Now, let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, you cannot just quit your dialysis. Excuse me? In nursing, do we ever give advice? No, we don't. And what do you mean you can't just quit? You can't force them not to. We don't give advice in nursing, so that's wrong. Three, I'll call your nephrologist right now. So you're not even going to get them to express their feelings. You're not going to get them to talk. You're just going to call the doctor and pass the buck. Do we ever pass the buck in nursing? No. So that's wrong. Choice four, make your funeral arrangements. Guys, that's not therapeutic. You don't say that to your patient. So the correct answer is two, you want to use reflection. Um, next question. The nurse is discussing kidney transplant with a client at a dialysis center. Which population is less likely to participate in organ donation? One, Caucasian, two, African-American, three, Asian, or four, Hispanic? And guys, the correct answer is two, African-American. Now, studies have shown that not every African-American, obviously, guys, but generally speaking, African-Americans believe that the body must stay intact after death. And so they're least likely to do organ donations. And so, <coughs> excuse me, guys. And so because of that, it's very hard for African-Americans to find donors. So they tend to, they tend to be on the list for transplants longer because remember, 
you got to do cross matching, right? And so it's harder to find a match for the African Americans because African Americans tend not to do organ donation just because, as I said, they believe that the body must remain intact even after death. The client receiving dialysis is complaining of being dizzy and lightheaded. Which action should the nurse implement first? One, place the client in Trendelenburg position. Two, turn off the dialysis machine immediately. Three, bolus the client with 500 milliliters of normal saline. Or four, notify the doctor as soon as possible. And guys, the correct answer is one, you're gonna put the client in Trendelenburg position. So you're gonna have that head way lower than the legs. Why? You want that brain, brain, you want that blood that carries the oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, everything. You want that blood to go where? To the brain. So that's why you place that patient in Trendelenburg's position. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices too. Turn off the dialysis machine immediately. Excuse me? All of that patient's blood that's in the machine, that the machine's cleaning out the toxins, that blood has to go back to the patient. What do you mean turn off the machine? The patient needs their blood, so you're not gonna do that. Choice three, bolus the patient with 500 mLs of normal saline. We don't do that, guys, unless that's our last option. Why? I want you to think about this. The patient's getting dialysis because the kidney's not working anymore, so the machine is acting as a kidney. So here you are, you have this patient that's holding on to all this fluid because the kidneys aren't working. That's why they're going to the dialysis machine to get rid of all of that fluid. Why would you go ahead and inject 500 mLs of fluid into that patient? That makes no sense. So that's incorrect. Um, choice four, notify the doctor. For what? Why would we notify the doctor? This is um, uh, hypotension is something that we expect to see during dialysis because so much fluid is being removed from the patient right? So you don't call the doctor immediately. And guys, I talked to you about this before. Before you choose that answer of call the doctor, and sometimes that's the only thing you can do. But before you choose that as the answer, look at your choice and say to yourself, is there anything that I can do for my patient before I turn to call the doctor? And yes, you can put them in Trendelenburg's position and get more of that blood um, rushing to their brain. Not rushing, but you guys know what I mean, okay? Next question, the nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with chronic kidney disease writes a client problem of non-compliance with dietary restrictions. Which intervention should be included in the plan of care? One, teach a client the proper diet to eat while undergoing dialysis. Two, refer the client and significant other to the dietitian. Three, explain the importance of eating the proper foods. Or four, determine the reason the client not adhering to the diet. And guys, the correct answer is four. Add pie. You assess before you do anything else. Guys, in order to do your other choices, choice one, two, and three, you would have had to have done four first. You would have had to find out why they're being non-compliant. Think about it. What if the reason that patient's being non-compliant, not because they just want to be non-compliant, but because they can't afford healthy foods. The only kind of foods they can afford are the foods at the corner store where they're selling potato chips and hot sausage or whatever is going on. They can't afford healthy foods, right? So you wouldn't even know that you needed to refer the patient to a social worker where the patient could get resources in the community to help them get what they need. You wouldn't have known that if you didn't assess the patient. So how do you know, maybe the patient knows the kind of foods they need to eat, they just can't afford it. You don't know until you assess. Remember, assessing is not only physically looking at your patient. Assessing is doing things that get you information, whether it's a physical exam, whether it's going through the patient's chart, whether it's asking questions. Anything that um, gathers information is a form of assessment. You're gonna ask questions and get information. You can assess. The nurse is inserting an indwelling catheter into a female client. Which intervention should be implemented? Which intervention should be implemented rank in order of performance? Okay, we're doing indwelling catheter. So here are your choices. One, explain the procedure to the client. Two, set up sterile field. Three, inflate the catheter bulb. Four, place absorbent pads under the client. Five, clean the perineum from clean to dirty with betadine. So we're putting this in order. So the first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna explain the procedure to the client. That's number one. Next, you're gonna do number four. You're gonna place the pads under the client. 
Then you're gonna do number three, you're gonna set up your sterile field. Then, excuse me, you're gonna do number two, you're gonna set up your sterile field. Then you're gonna do number three, you're gonna inflate the catheter bulb. And lastly, you're gonna do number five, clean the perineum. Um, clean the perineum from clean to dirty with betadine. All right, next question. The nurse performed bladder irrigation through an indwelling catheter. The nurse instilled 90 milliliters of sterile normal saline. The catheter drained 710 milliliters. What is the client's output? And guys, the client's output is 620 mLs. How did I get that? Remember, it drained 710, but what did we put in the client? 90. So what we did was 710 minus our 90, and it gave us our 620. So it's 620 milliliters. <coughs> Excuse me. The nurse is examining a 15-year-old female who's complaining of pain, frequency, and urgency when urinating. After asking the parents to leave the room, which question should the nurse ask the client? One, when was your last menstrual cycle? Two, have you noticed any change in the color of your urine? Three, are you sexually active? Or four, what have you taken for the pain? And guys, the correct answer is three, are you sexually active? And they even gave you a hint in the question. Why would you kick the parents out for any other question, right? You're gonna kick them out when you're asking them about sex because obviously they may not want to be honest with you if mom and dad is standing right there. Why are we asking them, are you sexually active? What are we suspecting? Cystitis, inflammation of the bladder, right? Inflammation, infection of the bladder. And um, cystitis is usually called, caused by sex, you know, sexual intercourse. So that's why you're asking them, are you sexually active? The client's reporting chills, fever, and left costal vertebral pain. Which diagnostic test should the nurse expect the doctor to prescribe? First, one, a midstream urine for culture, two, sonogram of the kidney, three, IV pyelogram for renal calculi, or four, CT scan of the kidneys. And guys, the correct answer is one, a midstream urine for culture. Why? What are we suspecting? Pyelonephritis. We're suspecting pyelonephritis. Why are we suspecting pyelonephritis? If you go back to the question, look at the um, symptoms. Chills, that's systemic. Fever, that's systemic. Costal vertebral, take your two hands, guys, and place them behind your back like this. Where your hands are touching, that's your costal vertebral area where those kidneys are, right? So we're not thinking bladder infection. That's not the lower abdomen back, that's not the lower abdomen back here where I'm touching. That's your CV or your costal vertebral anger. Anger, angle, I can't speak today. That's your costal verte vertebral anger. Costal vertebral angle, 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 right? So you're suspecting pyelonephritis. Um, something else I want to tell you about pyelonephritis. What did I want? I just got that brain fart. Oh, yes. So with pyelonephritis, we're suspecting that, but we want to confirm it with the urine culture. We want to see, do we see um, um, nitrites, nitrates? Do we see bacteria? Do we see blood? So we're going to do a urine culture. We want to see what is growing in that urine. Uh, the nurse is caring for a client with chronic pyelonephritis. Which assessment data supports the diagnosis of chronic pyelonephritis? One, client has fever, chill, chills, flank pain, and dysuria. Two, client complains of fatigue, headaches, and increased urination. Three, client has um, group B beta hemolytic strep infection last week. Or four, the client has an acute viral pneumonia infection. And guys, I hope you didn't get tricked by this question. The correct answer is two. The client has complaints of fatigue, headaches, and increased urination. And I know you wanted to choose one. I know you did because we just talked about pyelonephritis, right? But number one, the fever, chills, flank pain, dysuria, that's acute pyelonephritis. But this question is asking us about chronic pyelonephritis. And in chronic pyelonephritis, you see these symptoms of number two, the fatigue, the headache, increased urination. Also, a patient may have weight loss. They may have anorexia. They may have excessive thirst in chronic pyelonephritis. Choice three, the answer about the beta hemolytic strep. We see that in glomerulonephritis, um, the, the 
B, B beta hemolytic strep, that can cause glomerulonephritis. And choice four, um, acute viral pneumonia, that can cause glomerulonephritis. But for chronic pyelonephritis, the correct answer is two. The female client in an outpatient clinic is being sent home with a diagnosis of a UTI. Which instructions should the nurse teach to prevent a recurrence of UTI? One, clean perineum from back to front after bowel movement. Two, take warm tub baths instead of hot showers daily. Three, avoid immediately preceding sexual intercourse. Or four, avoid coffee, teas, colas, and alcoholic beverages. And guys, the correct answer is four, avoid coffee, teas, colas, and alcoholic beverages. Why? Those are irritants to the bladder. Patient's got a UTI, it's gonna make it worse. We want the patient, patient stay away from bladder irritants. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, clean the perineum from back to front, no. How are you supposed to clean the perineum? Front to back, so that's wrong. Choice two, take warm tub baths, absolutely not. We don't want them to take tub baths. That's gonna, um, we tell patients not to take tub baths because that can place patients at risk for getting UTIs. We want patients to take what instead? Showers, so that's wrong. And then choice, Three, um, uh, avoid immediately preceding sexual intercourse. No, we want them to avoid immediately after sexual intercourse because what happens is the pathogens that could have been on the vagina, urethra, right? When the immediately after intercourse, when the patient voids, they can flush it out. And so guys, the correct answer um, is four. And guys, that was our last question I'm over my time, but I hope you guys found this video to be helpful. I'm asking you guys, please, to help my channel, well, my channels with an S, please help them grow. I'm really trying to do this for you guys full time. So I need your help in this. If you know anyone that would benefit from my videos, please share. Please don't forget to uh, check me out on TikTok. I have lots of content on there for you to practice questions. I'm also on Instagram. And please don't forget to like and subscribe below. And I'll see you guys on my next video.